Hello, Tom Levecki here with the New Theory Podcast. I'm actually here in Miami, and I'm here with Dr. Miami. Dr. Miami, welcome to the New Theory Podcast. How are you doing today? What up, what up, what up? Can I give myself a little bit round of applause? <laughs> uh, so- we are in the trap house, and he is on the throne. So we'd like to start out, Dr. Miami. Tell us a little bit about your formative years, where you grew up, and what makes you you. Oh man, that's uh, you have like four hours. <laughs> um, as much as he needs. So I, I I grew up in uh, Rockland County, New York, Orangeburg, small town, nice. uh, about uh, thirty five minutes out of Manhattan. And uh, we're from Jersey, so Bergen County. Yeah. So all right, so I went to high school in Bergen <laughs> County. So that's right on the border there, Bergen County. Um, as a child, I watched a lot of Mash. You know that TV show with Alan Alda. That's right. And I thought that's what I want to be when I grow up. I want to be a surgeon <laughs> that operates in tents and makes jokes. Because that's what I thought surgery was. It wasn't until much, much later I realized that those were just actors and comedians. But anyway, um, so that I literally got me on the, on the path to medicine from watching that TV show. Um, and I told my dad, my dad bought me like a $3 stethoscope from a drugstore. And uh, my dad didn't go to college or anything. Anyway, so I would listen to his heart rate, his heartbeat every uh-huh. night. Before I went to sleep. So, that, that's, so that kind of set me on the path towards medicine. You know, fast forward to, uh, you know, 17 years, I, I was... Uh, I was 17, 18 years old. I started college. I was volunteering in hospitals and trying to figure out what kind of surgery I wanted to do. Looking at orthopedic surgery, neurosurgery. And then my girlfriend at the time got into a car accident. She got a, a really nasty scar across her lower lip. Oh, actually wow. went all the way through to like, see her teeth like through her Aye. lower lip. Told her car. Anyway, um, when it healed, she had a scar that looked kind of like a caterpillar. It crawled underneath her lip. <laughs> and it really bothered her. So... Um, we went to a plastic surgeon in Manhattan. That's the first time I met a plastic surgeon in my entire life. And uh, I had never seen a before and after picture of plastic surgery. This is like 1990 or so, before the internet and all that stuff. Anyway, when she went in for a consultation on his desk was what looked like a wedding album. Thick, heavy photographs of before and after pictures. And when I remember looking through that book and just being totally blown away, like, Where'd the butt go? And yeah, how'd the breast get there? And where'd the nose disappear to? It was like, it was just magic to me. And, you know, when he came, when she came out of the consultation, and I, I was like, wow, what the heck is this? He's like, this is plastic surgery. Um, I said, well, you know, I want to go to med school. And he said, well, look into plastic surgery. And, uh, and I did. So when I started uh, med school the next summer, I went right to the plastic surgery department. Uh, you know, I basically threw myself at their feet and said, I'll wash your car, do your laundry, whatever. <laughs> Teach me whatever I need to know. And that was uh, 24 years ago. So that's it. Wow. That's that's it. And by the way, she's my wife, that girl. So wow, God bless. So the time and investment uh, paid off. Yeah, for her too. <laughs> there you go. All right. So with that being said, so you wanted to get into plastic surgery. Now, obviously, when you started, you're not Dr. Miami. But when you started, give me the difference when you started, and what did you do, and and what did you do to kind of hit your stride before we kind of get into the Snapchat revolution. Yeah. So. You know, I went into practice. Uh, the advice that one of my mentors gave me when I finished my training, I was about 31 or something. By the time I finished med school, my residency fellowship, all that stuff. He said, just find the most expensive neighborhood <laughs> in your city and open a practice there, which is what I did. Um, only, turns out there are a lot of other people with the same idea. So <laughs> there was a lot of competition. And, you know, it just takes a few years, I would say five to seven years as a surgeon before you get comfortable enough to start to really, what's the word? Show, not about show off, but yeah. like, you know, you feel comfortable enough um, to, you know, to do the Dr. Miami stuff that we do. Yeah. So um, I could not have been Dr. Miami straight out of the gate. That's impossible. Correct. It wasn't until I was in practice about 10 or maybe even 12 years that the whole Dr. Miami thing really took off because you have to do a certain number of surgeries, literally thousands of surgeries before you feel comfortable enough operating in front of a camera, a live camera, with hundreds of thousands of people watching. So, um, yeah, that's it. I mean, it's just like good timing. You know, the technology came around at just the right time in my career that I could take advantage of it. And, you know, I was open-minded enough, I think, to, um, to listen to my younger staff members who all were saying, you should be on Instagram, you should be on Snapchat, you should be on all these things. And I resisted it, like most you know, middle-aged, older guys, <laughs> surgeons. So, but once we went into it, you know, we, we just, it just took off. So we're real happy about it. Well, but the thing is, the thing is, you didn't just like get together and just say, hey, I'm going to create an account. You're a 
fucking monster. Sorry, I mean, but you just are, right? And and <laughs> you just are, and and you took it to a whole nother level. Okay, We're, you, you know, so like like so you, you set up, you leveled up, you leveled up. So so when did you know? Okay, you get on Snapchat. I heard like your daughter told you about it and all those traditional questions, which is great. But at the end of the day, you did it and it, you just blasted. Yeah. So uh, so I mean, we had a specific like you know you're you're you know you're a marketer, right? Yeah. You know you know marketing, you know how difficult it is to reach your your audience but for me the the like the light bulb moment was to start to see the world through my target demographics eyes and not through my own eyes like good point so that is you know and not only that but like to love them like if you love somebody you love what they love so like yeah. that's kind of like cliche but it's true you know so you know, I, I only operate on women between the ages of 15 and 50. Um, my average patient age is about 30. So like, I just started to look at the world through the eyes of a woman. Is that weird? Does that sound like- uh, I maybe mean, dress like one occasially. <laughs> no, 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 but you know, but, but I, but like, if you start to, if you start to yeah. think that way, yeah. as a marketer, you, you know, you, you connect, you know, yeah. and when you make like a real genuine connection, that it just it just works, and so that's that's my that's my advice, and that's whatever secret there is, that will be it. Um, but you know, the the you know you have to be able to step out of yourself. True. You know, and uh, yeah, that's it. That's it. That's how it, that's how it happens. Now, now the thing is, and, and an important key is. It takes 17 years of being overnight success. So people probably see <laughs> yeah, you. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> people it see takes you. 17 years of being overnight success. No, it's true. You have to. You have to. You have to work hard. Um, and you know, if you look at the development of my career, you know, from the children's book on, from the yeah. from the from the children's book on, which was already you know five years into my practice, um, you know, I, I, I again, I, again, trying to trying to identify with my patients and their needs as opposed to like what I think would be most interesting to me. So the children's book was like the first, the first um, thing that got like national attention that like yeah. got me, and I, I sort of understood from both the patient's perspective, the market's perspective, and also like the media's perspective of what they're interested in. So, um, and then, you know, I started commenting on celebrity plastic surgery. Like I, like, I never turn away an opportunity to give an opinion. Yeah. You know, professional opinion on something, yeah. and there were a lot of surgeons that were like, you know, oh, that's not, you know, I'm like, no, th th this is part of the game. It's part of the game of, of the media of being a celebrity. They Correct. want you. They want to be in all, all those pictures of of paparazzi. You know, they're not. They're all scheduled yeah. photo shoots. You know, <laughs> yeah. they don't happen to end up on a beach. Yeah. You know, looking perfect with their makeup on and their that's hair done. That's right. And the paparazzi catches them like that. So. Once you understand a little bit about how the media works from that side, you know you can use whatever business you're in yeah. can, can maximize exposure through those kinds of things. Now, one of the, one of the um, biggest misconceptions is that um, social media is free, and it's not because you have you have yeah, staffers, I mean, yeah, yeah, so forth. So yeah. So, so social media is 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 not as free as you think. But look, it's more free right. than say Google Pay Per Click. Correct, it's not correct, like correct, correct, correct. you know. And, and you can spend a fortune on Google Pay Per Click if you're if you have a small business or yeah. something or a large business, but um, but it's not entirely free. Number one, it tr it demands your time, yeah. a lot of time and a lot of attention. And to the extent that you are consistent with it, you will grow an audience. But if you ignore it and you ignore your audience, and I don't just mean posting regularly, I mean interacting with the comments, interacting with your direct messages. If you don't interact with your audience, it will not grow. So once we started to get past a certain threshold of followers and messages, I realized that I couldn't do it myself. We had to hire people. We have two full-time wow. Snapchat, Instagram people. Wow. You know, and they do all the answer, try to answer every message. Um, you know, I have a call center that tries to go through the comments and pick stuff out and answer people's questions. And then at some point it grows beyond any one, you know, the amount of attention is beyond any one business can handle. Yeah. So like, now we don't really take consultations anymore. Wow. Uh, we're, so we're at yeah, end. we're booked. I mean, it's like so. It's, you try to think of like <laughs> how can you hand? It's like uh, drinking out of a fire hydrant. <laughs> I mean, it's like I mean, it's a it's a blessing, you know. Yeah. But it's also it creates like success creates new problems or 
situations that you have to figure out as yeah. well. So that's the other thing. It's like the flip side of of you know trying to break in, and then once you yeah. break in and you and and you have millions of people you know that are interested in your business and what you do and your service. How do you handle that? Yeah, and as an entrepreneur, we call that you know critical mass, which which you've hit yeah. in spades. So, but as a surgeon, though, and you know this, and you're trained, there's patient selection. So people just think you go to a plastic surgeon, and unless they're like super unethical, they're gonna say, hey, I can do it, or hey, or not. Right, right, right. Are there challenges with the increased level on patient connection, and is it tough for you to say no? No, actually, it's easy for me to say no. Okay. I say no all the time. I mean, in fact, I think that that's the the if there's one thing that separates our practice from other practices is that we say no more often than most people do. I mean, we only operate on a select uh, patient population. So besides the fact that you can't be over the age of 50, you have to be perfectly healthy. You cannot be a smoker. We check your urine for nicotine. Uh, Uh, You can't have diabetes, high blood pressure, uh, anemia. All these common, you know, minor health, they, they, they rule you out for having surgery here because, you know, you know, God forbid, you know, what we do is elective. So God forbid we have some kind of death or, or, or something tragic like that. So we, we want, yeah, God forbid. So um, we do everything we can to make sure that we only operate on patients that are perfectly healthy. Everybody gets full medical clearance, blood work, EKG, all that kind of stuff. Um, and I will cancel patients at the drop of a hat. If the day of surgery, they fail their nicotine test or their BMI is too high. Like we don't mm-hmm. operate on people with a BMI above 30 now. Oh, wow. 30. So like... You know, that eliminates like, you know, 60% of the U.S. population. I wouldn't be able to get surgery here. <laughs> yeah, so, so that's like, so right off the bat. Now, um, and the reason is, like, I, I've always been a strong believer that, you know, plastic surgery is not for weight loss. There are, there's a, that's a different specialty. Yep. Bariatric surgery for weight loss or diet and exercise. Plastic surgery is for contouring your body. So once you're at a, a healthy weight, we can then change the shape that you were born with into one that you like better. Whether it means bigger breasts, smaller breasts, bigger butt, tinier weight, whatever those contour things are, and then of course stuff you can't do in the gym, like nose, uh, you know, ears that stick out or something like that. So um, I think there's a misconception that people think, oh, you're going to come to the plastic surgeon fat and leave skinny. That doesn't work, you know, because if you're not, well, besides the fact that you're at increased risk for a complication being being heavier, but also um, if you don't change your lifestyle, you're just going to get fat again, and it's like a waste of your time. Waste of your money, waste of my time. Yeah. So we see now. Now, um, I notice I do follow. I'm not a big Snapchatter, but I do follow you on Instagram. I have followed you online. I notice you're mostly surgical heavy on your promotions. Are you still doing the non-surgical stuff? Or are you kind of abandon that because you're so busy with your surgical schedule, yeah, or yeah, do you so, still do non-surgical? Yeah, so non- I've kind of, I've kind of eliminated the non-surgical yeah. stuff from my personal. Oh, wow, okay. uh, like I don't do it myself, yeah. but I have uh, you know CR, um, the RMPs and PAs that do the Botox and that sort of thing. Um, but you know I focus my time on the surgery. Yeah. It's just more fun for yeah. me. You know it's more challenging and uh, it's what I it's what I train to do and like. I mean, I hate to say it, but like a monkey can do Botox. A monkey can do Botox. I mean, it, it sounds ridiculous, but if you if you've ever had Botox a few times, you realize, you know, yeah, kind of a monkey can do this. Um, no offense to all the dermatologists that are out there, especially the, especially especially the referring ones. Especially the, yeah, you know, and that's the other thing. The beauty of plastic surgery, um, or I guess cosmetic dentistry and things like yeah. that, is is I don't need referrals. Like yeah. most doctors. Yeah. If you're an endocrine guy, you're yeah. only getting patients right. through other doctors. No one's opening the yellow pages and looking for an endocrinologist. Right. But as a surgeon, and in a specialty like plastic surgery where the lay public can evaluate the quality of the work themselves, it's a blessing because I can market directly to patients and potential patients. So, for example, if there's like a surgeon that's like an awesome general surgeon and can do take out your gallbladder in 20 minutes, yeah. You will never really know how good he did a job because it's all on the inside. Correct, correct. All you see is a little tiny scar. He may actually be terrible. He may have almost killed you, but you would not know that. <laughs> true, you know? True. Whereas plastic surgery, all that counts is the before and the after picture. True. You know, and true. anybody can look and say, Oh yeah, she looks much better. True. Now before we conclude some rapid fire questions, um, what guy were you in high school? Which you know stereotype uh, were you in high school? I don't, you know, people ask me that. I don't, I, I, I was kind of a weirdo, I guess. No, I was like. Well, you're good looking, so you weren't a nerd. No, I was kind of a nerd. I was kind okay. of a nerd. I mean, was, I, I mean, I was, you know what? I, I kind of like drifted between different groups. Yeah. You know, like I, I wasn't like, yeah, it's, it's, I don't know. It's, that's such a deep question. Okay. You know, I, I, uh, 
you know, I was on the swim team. Does that count? It's not really a jock, you know. <laughs> but like, you have been six packs. Sport. So yeah, I was on a six pack, and I, I, you know, I had to get up in the morning, go to practice, and stay late. But I was not like a jock. Like I, like I couldn't play basketball. Although now I, re- now I really love basketball. I don't play, but I like watching it. But so I was kind of like in between all those kind of groups. Yeah. Um, and and I went to Brooklyn College and okay. Community College, and I think oh, wow. I think that also helped me a lot in 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 becoming who I am because like. I feel like a lot of my friends that were smart and went to, let's say, Harvard or, or Penn or one of these Ivy League places, they kind of all, I mean, and maybe I'm generalizing, but my impression was that they were all like the same kids. Like they all kind of read the same books, yeah. came from very similar backgrounds. Okay, one, one kid was Asian, one kid was African American. But really, when they got together in a room, they all liked the same kind of nerdy oh, books and the same nerdy yeah. stuff. <laughs> and like, Whereas, you know, going to community college, going to city college, you meet like a, a, a swath of humanity <laughs> and you interact with them, you get to be friends with them, you get to know people. And so I think that kind of, and, and you're not like snotty at all when you leave that kind of institution. Yeah, yeah. I went and I went to med school at like a real high level med school. Yeah. And I feel like I was able to, um, I'd rather come from that to there than yeah. start out to, you know, I went to Harvard and then like every time, you know, you meet somebody, you're kind of looking down your nose at them. Yeah. So um, I think that helped me also in private practice and in, in the hospital setting. Because when you when you're in a resident or you're training in a hospital, guess who you're meeting? You know, yeah. you're meeting regular yeah. people. Yeah. You know, you're not meeting Ivy League people, and you, and you're um, you have to know how to talk to people and yeah. relate. You know. But th- that fits your narrative. So um, um, less. Remember, it's rapid fire. Yeah. Less book. I just can yeah. Less book you read. Last book I read, I'm in the middle. I'm in the middle of reading. Uh, um, if I have to tell you one more time, it's a parenting book by uh, Amy McGrady. Okay. Which is a great book, by the way. If you have kids, get that book right now. Beautiful. Um, I read a lot. So I read a lot. Like, nice. Kind of What's next? Because at this point, your your practice is killing it. You're living the space. You're you're living in. You're loving it. Um, what's next for you? I would love to make a like a conglomeration of plastic surgery practices around the country. I would love to be like a, a surgeon slash CEO and like um, get like really good docs in every city and kind of turn plastic surgery from like a mom and pop individual Sounds practices like that. that have varying quality and varying to, you know, yeah. like, oh, and into more like, into like the way Blockbuster was yeah. when you know when when there used to be mom and pop video yeah. rental places and yeah. then blockbuster came out it was like wow this is so much so much a better experience yeah. i'd like something like that 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 would be my next professional challenge and, and it's funny you mentioned that because as, as we talked earlier so i know the space pretty well do marketing in the space mm-hmm. and nobody's really done that no, but no dermatology nobody, nobody in plastic nobody surgery do it because until social media marketing i don't think it was i don't think it was really until the internet and social media i don't think it was possible to really get uh, a message like that out great po- effectively you know you can't like by national TV ads for five plastics or correct. Devices, but social media can do it. Correct. Now, um, it's not a rapid fire question. I want to go back to this. Sure. One thing I'm fascinated with is with entrepreneurs. You're an entrepreneur, let's be yeah. honest, right? You're plastic surgery, medical first, patients first, but you're also yeah. an entrepreneur. And one thing I'm pretty fascinated with seeing the people go from entrepreneur to CEO. So you're killing it, you're getting busy, but now you're like, oh my God, uh, my accounts receivable is this and I need to hire four people and all that kind of stuff. So now you're going to go from like a maybe builder to an operator. How is that transition going for you? Well, Did I, you- I haven't started yet. I was, I've, okay. started, I've started to lay the groundwork for it. Yeah. I've started reading a lot of books about yeah. how to do it and, and this and that. I would still like to be like four days a week surgeon yeah. and one day a week admin yeah. yeah admin you know and i've got a great team around me you know i've got an mba that works for me i've got nice. a lawyer that works for me so we have a great team um so like I, i'm not gonna necessarily be the leg you know on the ground in all these places but i'll oversee and, and direct everything favorite celebrity wow um um hold on Gosh, I'm gonna make somebody mad if I answer that. <laughs> <laughs> Be a new theory exclusive. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna make somebody mad if I answer that. <laughs> I love them all. It's so hard to pick just. It's like trying to pick a child, a favorite child. They're, That's right. I love them all. All right, so that's a lame answer, but really, I'm gonna make somebody mad. 
And uh, we want to appreciate you having us. And what New Theory is about is developing a new theory and looking kind of the old way of doing things, but having kind of forward-thinking thought. And that's what New Theory is about. So you're basically revitalizing or revolutionizing plastic surgery. I can't imagine, though, you got to ASAP, CSPS, or whatever society you belong to. Yeah. They're probably like a pain in the balls, let's be honest, right? So, they're so, like banging their cane. Yeah, yeah. They're like, they're like, they're like, they're like they're walkers. <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing with those Facebooks? <laughs> um, will you please get off my space? All right, so, with that, <laughs> so with that being said, uh, Dr. Miami, any parting words, um, um, a rap, anything, give us yeah, anything. I mean, you know? the, parting, the parting words is, I mean, I, don't, I, I mean, if millennials are going to yeah. listen to this and they're young. I mean, think long term. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's all. Like you said in the beginning, it's, it takes 17 years to be an overnight success. Yeah. So you got to think in those in that kind of time time frame, and the other thing is, um, you know, if everybody's zigging, you zag. Yeah, that's it. Love it, uh, Doctor Miami, uh, Tom Levecchia here with the New Theory Podcast, and thank you for your time.